Hi, I'm Diana. And I'm Zach. And we're the Farrier's Bellows, a podcast dedicated to bringing you games and tools to take your adventures further. We're going to be talking about non-traditional indie RPGs, some that have been around for years, others that are newer to take you beyond the ordinary. Today, join us as we lock horns in Troll Babe. Our first segment is The Call to Adventure. Troll Babe is a game written by Ron Edwards. If that name sounds familiar to you, it is because Ron Edwards is a co-founder of The Forge, the website dedicated to game theory and game design that we sort of take our name from. Uh, Edwards co-founded The Forge in 2001 with Clinton R. Nixon, and Troll Babe came out in its first edition in 2002. The version we played is the re-released print edition, or, or I should say probably second edition, that was released in 2008. It is a fantasy game published through Adept Press. It's a game about half troll, half babe, badass warrior women, and mages who are outside both the walls humans erect and the cavernous troll layers in the mountains. Viewed warily by both civilizations and more powerful than either, how will troll babes make their way in the world? Over-the-top fantasy, like the kind you see airbrushed on vans, with a heart of seeking belonging and questioning what makes us act righteously, are at the core of this game. So you start this game by picking, by creating yourself a troll babe. She's a very babe-like large woman. And once you start, once you have this image in your mind, you start creating your stats. You do that by picking a troll number, which is a number picked from 1 through 10. That number is now your basis for figuring out all of your other stats. Your fighting stat is all of the numbers that are under your troll number. So for example, if your troll number is seven, your fighting is, your fighting stats are one through six. Your magic stat is the number above your troll number. So if your troll number is seven, those numbers are eight through 10. And then your social number is your worst stat plus your troll number. So in this case, since my troll number is seven, that number would be seven through 10. If, you, if you're trying to fight someone, you're trying to get the numbers one through six. That's what those numbers are. And that's your stats. That's it. It's pretty simple. Diana, what are some things that you liked about this game? I liked the simplicity of the stats. It's so easy to like comprehend. Once you get your numbers, you're done. There's no guessing. There's no like trickery. There's no, well, in this situation, maybe it's this, but also I have this. Like, is it dexterity or is it? Th no, it's you're fighting. This is a social situation or you're using magic. That's it. Are you arguing or are you fighting? Are you cast, casting a spell or are you sweet talking them? Like that's it. There's no, there's not a lot of gray areas there. And the simplicity of the stats make it much easier to kind of focus on the storyline. I'm not worried about the crunchiness. I'm worried about the flow. Yes. Like that very basic level of mechanics. Th there's some other stuff that makes things a little bit more complicated, oh, yeah, but it, at its core, at its most basic, you're rolling 1d10 and trying to get somewhere based on your troll number. Yeah, absolutely. What about you? What's something you liked? As we start to get a little bit more complicated with that, I really like the conflict system. So the conflict system is this really interesting way of uh, building up the scene when you have a problem going on, right? And it has a few different moving parts to it that make it more or less complicated. Uh, the first is that you determine how granular you want to get with this conflict. Uh, so if you want to get really granular and you want to see every blow, uh, you can go with a three roll test. Uh, if you want to go kind of a little bit more sweeping, there's just big uh, swatches of action that you want to pay attention to. You can resolve a conflict in two rolls. And if you want to just go at its most basic, a conflict of one roll. That sort of uh, dial of granularity I found very useful. And it was a great way to help keep pace throughout the session and consider how zoomed in on a conflict that you wanted to get. Mm -hmm. uh, setting up a conflict is also very uh, cooperative. So the player gets first say 
on what type of conflict it is and then the gm can like bounce it up or down one so if we started and you said you wanted a a one role conflict i would only be able to take that to a two role conflict right and just the way that they're framed and some of the other aspects that go into conflicts make them a very rewarding testing system it was a lot of fun on the player's end um that that sort of the flexibility that you as a gm have with that but it's not a ton of flexibility. I, I kind of knew what to expect. It was fun to play. It was fun to to be on the receiving end of it. Absolutely. Is there anything else that you liked? Yes. So continuing along with conflicts, right? Uh, it pro- it sounds probably pretty brutal. Uh, the thought of you get one roll to see if you succeed or fail a test. What happens from there is you have different things that uh, allow you to re-roll on a test if you fail. And one of those things are relationships. Over the course of a session, you are generating relationships with other characters, with NPCs. And you can call in a relationship to have you do a reroll. And if you have a relationship with somebody, you can always, if you can find the most strenuous circumstance to have them come in and help you, uh, even if they are an antagonistic relationship it doesn't even have to be a positive relationship they can come in and aid you and what i think is really cool about that is that you build relationships with people by having conflicts with them once you have a conflict with them the player can say all right i want a relationship with this person and it becomes this very cool interesting it feels very like television serial I like concept of how relationships are built. It's like kind of very like shonen anime. Um, like I got in a fight or an argument or I performed a ritual with you or something, and now we can we can connect in that way. I I mean I think that's real world too, right? Like if you get into an argument with someone, you know that person now. Mm-hmm. They're that person you got an argument with, like. You have a relationship with them. It's not a great one. It's not a positive one. You might not even know their name, but you're the dude who cut in front of me when I was buying my muffin. I'll never forget your face. Like, I, I don't know. I think it's a little real world. <laughs> Is that just me? Am I the only one who remembers the guy who cuts you off for your muffin? I uh, No. There's an entire Master of None episode all about that. I forgot about that. Uh, you kill me. I'm sorry. Uh, how about you, Diane? What else did you like about this? I really liked being a very large, intimidating woman. (laughs) I was, like, hot because you're a troll babe. You're not a troll lady, So you know, and you're not a troll woman or troll female. You're a troll babe. You are sprayed. You are spray painted on the side of vans. Your tits are out. Your waist is small. Your legs are long. You might be covered in hair and have horns. Like, you're still maybe grotesque. Who knows? But you could be a babe. And I liked that. I liked the idea of being a large, smart, badass woman. Yes. And troll babes come in all shapes and sizes. They do. Uh, it, I'm just going with, like, the spray paint on the side. Yeah, you yeah. brought You brought up spray paint on the side of a van. You're right. I'm continuing with that imagery. I mean, you could be covered in hair. You could be grotesque. You get to pick what your troll babe looks like. And I like the idea of being a large. Because you're large. You're, I think minimum minimum height is 6'6", six, 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 I think. Um, or 6'7". I, I want to say 6'8 was minimum height. Oh, maybe height. it's 6'8". You are, you're tall. Yeah. You're, you're a big woman. And it specifically says in the rule book that you are built to match your height. You're not like a twig. You're not a runway model. You are built to match your height because you're a troll babe. So you're like this large, larger than life woman with horns and like you get to decide the rest of it, but you have horns, you're tall and you're built to match your height and you're smart or I mean, well, you get to decide of that, but you're smart. You're a badass. I don't know. It's cool. And who keenly demands respect, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Whether or not people love you or hate you for being a troll babe, and that's humans and trolls, right? As a troll babe, you are outside of both societies and you can't really fit in. And people might hate you for that, but they respect you. They fear you, but they aren't going to... Nobody wants to get on the wrong side of a troll babe because... I'm a giant badass woman. They're giant badass women. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. It's my favorite. It's very cool. I So I'd been hearing about this game, Troll Babe, 
since I started role playing games, like since I got into the hobby, and I was always kind of, I was always very put off by the name. Um, and Troll Babe, I don't know, that's not really, that doesn't sound like my type of jam. But the way that they are treated in the game, they're just cool. They they just ooze coolness. Mm-hmm. It's not gratuitous or gross. It is cool. Yeah. And yeah, I agree. I like it. In a weird reversal of my own love for like very consistent tone, although I guess this is still consistent, in my own, I don't know, I like serious tone for the most part. You know me. I like Someone my stuff to be very like cohesive and fit into nice boxes. That is a pleasant way of describing what you <laughs> what you do. Yeah. Cruel. Listen, um, I have other words. In a weird reversal of that, I loved playing Troll Babes in this like Icelandic, Nordic, uh, maybe a little like Celtic vibe setting uh, where y'all are traveling, come to the the Jarl's longhouse and he just goes, ah, troll babes, eh? Like, that's just a word. That's just a normal word for this like high, like metal fantasy setting. It made me very happy in a way <laughs> that is hard to describe. It was weird and funny and like, stuck out it's just it does this interesting thing of creating like a little bit of like this anachronistic dissonance that just makes that sets them apart even more and makes them cooler yeah (laughs) i agree no i yeah i i agree i think it's cool i don't have i don't i'm not a stick in the mud like you about stuff (laughs) and i'm (laughs) i'm not a stick in the mud. that's how i would describe it but no i i love high fantasy so i love the idea of like of these very serious men and women being like, this is very serious. We need to bring in the troll babes. Like, I, I love that. That's just, like, right up my alley. High the, fantasy is my jam. That I, That's not high. I wouldn't say and, that's high but fantasy, it, but though. In that, my, but in my head, that setting is a, is a high, yes. feti- high fantasy setting. Yes. And so this makes sense that the Jarl or whoever would be like, troll babes, that's what we need. It feels like a high fantasy setting. Yes, high fantasy it is, is very, which is why yeah. the troll babe term sticks out more. No, I think it works. <laughs> If Bilbo Baggins was like, we need to bring in the troll babes. You mean the Hobbit? Yes. The the Hobbit. If Frodo the, the Hobbit, Hobbit You mean the thing that J.K. Ra- that J.K. Rowling. Oh my God, I'm so yep. mad at myself. Yeah. You, the thing. That How's that nerd cred going for you? <laughs> the thing that Tolkien made up. The thing he made up. Yes. If in the he middle- gets to make up whatever he wants. If he made up troll babe, then that would be awesome. <laughs> he gets to make up whatever he wants. Okay. Yeah, Frodo Baggins. All of them. You could see them saying troll babe. I can see all of them saying troll babe. Get out of here. Aragorn would absolutely be like, we need we need <laughs> the troll babes. <laughs> we must run from the troll babes. Legolas, with my with my special eyes, <laughs> I can see the troll babes. <laughs> this is devolving. All right. Is there anything else that you like? Uh, yeah, I actually like a lot of stuff. I really like that the game has a no prep structure. Uh, it specifically tells you not to prep anything. You should hand your players, as the GM, you hand your players a map, and you say, hey, where's your troll babe? And then they point out where on the map their troll babe is. And then you figure out, well, who would be here? What could possibly be at stake here? And uh, who would have a vested interest in that? And then you just see what happens. Um, It was a breath of fresh air for me as a, a consistent GM of fantasy games. It was also... I will say it had quite a bit of stress involved in it. I drew my own map and I was like so excited about this map. It has um, a giant world tree in the center of a forest called Acerheim. It has two gates on either side called the Sun Gate and the Moon Gate. It has the Dragon's Nash, this giant canyon in the center. It has a Viking uh, city called Thrusla has these islands spread about. I put it in front of Diana and our friend, Justin, who was also playing. I said, all right, the two of you, you don't have to be together. In fact, the the rules specifically say you shouldn't be together, but we'll get into that a little bit more. Say the two of you can be anywhere on this map. I gave them little beads. I said, you don't have to be together. You shouldn't be together. Just just wherever you want to be, wherever interests you. And Diana goes, okay. And she puts her bead right in the one, (laughs) one spot on the map that didn't just didn't have anything. Yeah, it's just totally blank. Um, and then <laughs> I Justin that goes. That makes sense for a journey. And then Justin goes, "Okay, well, I'll, I'll just be with her." And just puts his V right down next to her. I was like, "Okay, all right." 
Well, <laughs> I had hooks for a, everywhere we, else. We moved. We adjusted. Well, no, but then I I did, and I took it, and I came up with something on the fly, like the rules actually told me to do, and we had a great game. Mm-hmm. It was fantastic. It was wonderful, and I I think that going into it without prep and leaning into not having prep is very important with this game, and it, it worked really well. I agree. I agree. It was really fun to sort of discover the world at the same time that the GM is discovering the world. I mean, we could sit here and list lots and lots of games that tell you tell the GM not to prep, but it's always a fun experience when you are discovering the world at the same time that the GM is. It just makes it, I don't know, it just makes for a unique experience that's really fun to be a part of. Yeah, so we ended up having this this sort of mystery going on, mm-hmm. um, and the two of you came to this, uh, this Viking town. Uh, they'd been having trouble with uh, a Kelpie in the bay, and you were tasked with getting rid of it. So the two of you split up and started, like, investigating, and I had no idea what was going on, right? Because I was following the rules and it just said, come up with something that other people want in the setting, figure out what's at stake and go from there. And I was like, okay, well, this Kelpie is at stake. Let's go from there. And based on who y'all talked to and what you discovered and what happened, uh, we ended up coming up with like this rich mythology around the Kelpies and like uh, this weird, uh, like different church that was leading the Vikings and like all this other stuff that, uh, like folklore and legends that I had no idea going in. And that only happened because we built it up together Mm -hmm. and it was fantastic. Yeah, I agree. Anything else that you liked? Anything Um, else you wanted to bring up? No, not right now. Is there anything that you had questions about? Yes. So the game's specifies we kind of touched on it a little already the game specifies that the troll babes don't travel together um so when we're on the map we're supposed to be separately we're supposed to be in separate places we're supposed to be loners at least a little and i just don't know why like justin and i played troll babes in the same town investigating the same thing we were traveling together and i thought we told a great story i thought it was really fun and i don't think we would have told such a rich story if we would, we'd been separate and we still managed to spend a lot of the kind of campaign game separated we were in different thing different areas of the town we were doing our own thing for most of the game so i don't i just don't know why we had to be a loner i just i like this idea of just like a gang of large <laughs> women rolling up into town being like i own this stuff run away scared but also don't be too scared of us because we're cool yeah that's just not like really... a lot no but just like a lot i don't know it's like a cool image in my head just these giant women coming up to your gates like let us in feed us give us all the ale <laughs> um hey i think it worked well with you two together because we did a one shot and we've only played one game of troll babes uh and i think as a one shot it works really well like the multiple troll babes working together. I have a sneaking suspicion that where the game really shines, especially with players on sort of separate journey, characters on separate journeys, is in campaign play. And we can talk about that as we get a little closer to the inmost cave. Anything that you had questions about? I had something that stood out to me um, pretty significantly, and I might rant about it. Maybe a I little bit. I think it's okay. So we picked this book up at Breakout Con. I was super excited to find the print uh, second edition at Breakout Con this past year at a uh, used uh, like RPG bookstore. And I was so excited. I picked it up. Um, I brought it home. I didn't read it until I started prepping for this game. And then when I started reading it, I was like, wow, this language is, is pretty dense. And then dense moved to difficult, and then difficult moved to inaccessible. The language that this book is written at is possibly, I would argue, among the most inaccessible of any RPG book I've read. And I have some thoughts and questions about why that might be. But just to give you an idea, one segment that I pulled is, 
The medium of Troll Babe is dialogue. The substance of play is composed of people speaking and listening. Its content is the fiction, but the things of the fiction must be said to occur, understood to occur, and to be adopted as material for the next things to be said. Which is a very long way of saying this game is a conversation, right? The book is very full of these verbose descriptions of how gameplay works, as well as these diagrams of metacognitive thinking that, for me at least, largely stood in the way of comprehension as I was reading and trying to wrap my head around how this game works. Which, especially for a game whose rules are so streamlined and simple, the descriptions in the text of how the game works as a conversation were so verbose that I just had to stop several times um, and was getting frustrated a little bit. I am surprised that this is the first time that I think I've thought about the reading level of an RPG book. I, If I had to hazard a guess, I would guess that most RPGs, probably certainly most PBTA games, I would say, are written at about a 7th or 8th grade level. This book is written at least at a 12th grade level, which I don't think people realize how dense that actually is. Mm -hmm. Most things that we read in our day-to-day lives are like a middle school level, like 7th, 8th grade level. Yes, most most things that you read for either entertainment or news are at a 7th grade level. Um, The average writing level of most media is about 7th grade level. And this is significantly denser than that. And I noticed a couple interesting things. Uh, The first was, as I was reading this, I was like, wow, this 110-page book could probably be about 40 pages and get to everything that it needed. And when I found a copy of the original PDF version of this game, it was about 40 pages. And while I like the rule changes in second edition, uh, I think it improves on the rules a lot. It also... This new version is what has all of the descriptions of how RPG conversations work, how scene framing works, uh, all of these ideas that it really goes in, at length into trying to explain and describe in what I would say is like hob- theorist lingo. And what I wonder is, what I got the sense of, this book feels like it is written without the language that we have now mm-hmm. to describe how RPGs work in play. It feels like it is trying to describe those things that we've had a decade plus, um, largely thanks to games like Troll Babes, um, that we've had a decade plus of practice at describing these ideas and these concepts. And this book feels like it it lacks that language because it's trying to find and create that language. It's trying to create those ideas. And because of that, I feel like it's stumbling over itself at points. Yeah. When when we were discussing what we were going to do with the podcast, when, when we were playing the game, we talked about how would you describe the color green if you don't have the word for the color green? That's essentially what this book is doing. There's yeah. no word for the color green, but you have to describe the color green. You have to get this idea across. Yeah. And now that we have the color green, now that we have the word green, it's ridiculous that you'd go through all of these these descriptions and these roundabout ways of, of saying green. You could just say green. Well, now we can just say green. There wasn't green before. There wasn't a way to describe what was happening before. And we'll talk about it later, but I think it'd be interesting to see what this book would look like now, if it were written now. Yes. I, I mean, it is, it's like literally trying to describe collaborative scene framing without, it feels like it's trying to describe that without being Same. able to use the words collaborative scene framing, yeah. which I have not checked into too much. Like I said, this second edition came out in 2008, which feels like that's seven years into the Forge's existence. Um, so it might very well just be that. Troll Babes is partially an academic text. Mm -hmm. Like that just might be what it is. It might like it might be intended to be an academic text that uses game theory uh, lingo to get across ideas in a way that is more uh, in depth, more specific than the average RPG book does. And if that's the case, if that's the intention that it is academic, then that's fine. It is a. It was a huge barrier to me being able to run this game 
which is crazy for a game that is so simple <laughs> on right. on paper. Right. Uh, I, I literally think you could, if you just saw a character sheet, you could probably run Troll Babes uh, just fine. But reading the rules, I found m- confused me more. Our next segment is Approach the Inmost Cave. This week, I want to talk about how Troll Babe sets players up to be grand mythic heroes in what is possibly the best way I have seen of like a fantasy game. Mm-hmm. My favorite mechanic, which I, I'm, we're starting to learn. We're like 12, 13 episodes in and we're starting to learn how to do our podcast. So I didn't talk about this in my favorite mechanics section. <laughs> this game has a mechanic called scale. Scale goes from one to seven. And at the start of the game, you everyone at the table is scale one. And what that means is troll babes can only have conflicts with, they can only develop relationships with, and they can only enact meaningful change on one to two individuals at a time. And that is hugely important. That is, that's, it's, it's the meat of the game. That no matter how big, how tough, how smart, how cool the troll babes are, they can only defeat fight, kill, save, change the mind of one individual. And that scale goes up to seven. By scale four, that relationship increases to, you can affect an entire village that is self-governed and independent, but still significant. And by scale seven, you can affect, have conflicts with, and build relationships with a land, a country, a large area, including many communities within it. And your scale increases in between sessions whenever any player at the table says, I want scale to increase. So at a minimum, you need seven sessions to build up to scale seven. Realistically, you would have more than that. Realistically, you would probably have more than that. But what this does is it sets this solid, beautiful pace as we see the troll babes start out with nothing. They have no one, right? When a troll babe scene is set, at the start of a session, they are walking, usually alone, to their next adventure, to their next, to a village in the distance, right? And they come upon it and they they find some trouble that needs their assistance. They work on it and they try to solve it and they try to stop bad guys and help good guys and shape the world in their image. But at the start of it, they can't. By the end of it, they can lead armies. It, to me, feels so powerful, this idea of limiting character power in this way, not by how much stuff the character has or how many skills or abilities the character has, right? Which is how it's, in most fantasy games, your power is limited by your stuff, your skills, your things, right? Your character sheet, essentially. Yes, this has externalized your limitations and it feels fantastic in play. Your two troll babes, uh, Seagrin and what was your character's name? Hertha went into this village that was ha- that had a Kelpie problem. The Jarl demanded that you get rid of the Kelpie. And over the course of the session, you were like, no, screw this. The Kelpie's actually right. Y'all are wrong. We're gonna save the Kelpie. And you got into a conflict with the Jarl and you were able to convince him to say that he was going to protect the Kelpie. He wasn't going to kill the Kelpie. He wasn't going to get rid of the Kelpie. And you got the Jarl's word. And you even got the Jarl's word that he was going to put it into law. Like that no one in the village could bring harm to the Kelpie. But you didn't change anyone else's mind. Which has huge ramifications for future sessions. Right. And it is such a... Even even though we'll never return, well, I don't know, maybe we'll return to those characters in that campaign one day. But the end of that session, when you two realized that, that, oh, this is the only person, we can only affect change on one person, and this is who it is, and we have to hope that it's enough as you move on to the next session. Yeah, we didn't affect change with the church that was hunting the Kelpie. We didn't affect change with the town that was hunting the Kelpie or the scapegoat woman that they picked. Like, we didn't affect change with... For any of that, all we did was find essentially the mayor and we're like, hey, dude, fix this. And that works so beautifully because like a 
snowball, like a Katamari ball, in the next session, you're going to be able to affect more. Yeah. You built relationships, you built individual personal relationships over the course of that session that you can now take to your next campaign where your scale is going to increase and you can have bigger relationships with a with a group of people, with a gang or a family. And then as you continue on your adventures, your renown and your strength and the respect people have for you grows. And that's how you affect greater change. And that's how you perform greater feats of strength and cunning and power. It's so cool. It is, it is just the coolest. It is such a cooler way of thinking about character growth than levels Mm -hmm. in like then you killed enough monsters you got enough xp and now you have a new level and you're you have a new spell right it's i gained connections with people i affected change on people and that makes me more interesting that makes me more effective that makes me more powerful it also isn't tied necessarily to your experiences so as a player you have control over whether or not you get to increase your your like scope of your locus of control essentially like you get to you get to decide if you want it to increase or not so do you want a troll babe who no one knows and is inconsequential if that's what you want you never increase your scale if you want somebody who's going to take over the world you can do that in seven turns like you as a player have a ton of a ton of control over your levels whereas that's not true in any other game where you're your scope, your scope is tied to your experience level because you gain those through failures or you gain through those through something else. Like by playing the game, you increase your level and it's not something you have any control over, but you have complete control over this. And that's awesome. That, that power in the player's hand is awesome. In play, it just works so well. And I think that's why the game recommends you play in groups, but as lone characters, because over the course of a campaign, you would see all of these disparate characters forge connections and cross paths occasionally, right? If you're on a small, like, British Isles-like island, you would see them grow and they you would see them gain connections and you would, like, cross paths or you would go to a village that someone else had just been to and you would hear stories about them. And over the course of the game, you and the other players at the table, who, according to the rules, are the only troll babes in existence. Uh, troll babes are a rarity. They are unique. The only troll babes that exist are the ones playing at the table. And in the end, you would be so big and so vital and so important to the country that you would have to either work together or work against one another. It's this slow burn up to these huge titanic forces coming together and i think it would be phenomenal in play and that that's basically that's basically (laughs) it um along with this i do i want to say one thing that i forgot in the conflict when i was talking about how much i like conflicts one of the things that i like most about conflicts is that when you declare a conflict conflicts only occur between characters So when you say, all right, I think this is a conflict, either the player or the GM, what you are saying is, I think you are in conflict with another character, which inherently means, according to the rules, that that is a person that is important to you in the story, that you think has some sort of role in the story that it has that can affect the story in some way. And it doesn't have to be a person. The game specifically uses an example of If you are drowning in the ocean and you want to make a conflict out of it, you are saying that the ocean is a character. And if the ocean is a character, that means you can have a relationship with the ocean. And that means that the ocean has goals of its own, whether literal or figurative. And it just all builds on one another in this way that feels like the best sort of mythic, heroic stories of larger-than-life people in this case, larger than life troll babes, going up against fantastic forces and persevering and overcoming and exerting their will on the world in a way that feels powerful and fulfilling. And I think in the best circumstances, righteous, right? Didn't you just like feel righteous at the end of our first session of troll babes? I always feel righteous, so I don't know (laughs) if that's appropriate. 
Um, but I felt very cool, which is a very different feeling. No, I mean, I don't think so, right? I think there's a reason why righteous became like 80s slang for super radical, right? Oh. And uh, okay. I think there's a reason. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I also think there's a reason that radical became synonymous with cool. I think righteous, it, righteous to me fits on multiple levels with Troll Babes. It feels righteous. It does feel righteous. I hope that that ringing endorsement kind of <laughs> balances out how my railing against the, the language of the text. Well, I actually, I want to dive into that a little bit. Oh, so okay. something that I we kind of talk about and I'm trying to make a little bit more regular and a little bit more structured is kind of the new new player friendliness of the game, right? If you are trying to introduce a friend of yours who's never played role-playing games to gaming, is this a game you should use? And the quick and short of it for me is, yes, I think if you're trying to introduce this game to somebody, if you're trying to introduce role-playing games to somebody, this is a great game. There's minimal stats. It's very easy from a player standpoint. It's very easy to play. Um, It is a role-playing game. There's role play, which you, you all know is something that I feel like I struggle with when I don't have those prompts and those points to get to. But you have the whole table of people working with you and you've got hopefully a GM who can who can give you some some tips and help you figure out how you're going to set your scene and what you're going to do. Even though I have in the past been like, oh, it's a very heavy role play game. Like, I don't think it's necessarily new player friendly. I think the simplicity of this game make like more than makes up for that. I think this is a very new player friendly game. However, I'm going to ask you, Zach, is this a new GM friendly game? I cannot imagine that this is a good, easy, accessible game for a brand new GM unless for some reason that GM has been reading a ton of theory on just improv and acting and uh, human relationships and the concept of play and narrative framing. It's, it, is, it is an academic text with academic jargon. I feel like I've done a lot of reading on game theory, and I was unprepared to disentangle some of these concepts Mm -hmm. if i handed this to somebody who had never played a role-playing game before but who had come to me and been like hey i've heard about dungeons and dragons like what do you think could you show me something if i handed this to them i would be telling them i'd never want you to play rpgs (laughs) (laughs) basically um it's so intimidating that said that said if you are prepared to dig through that and you know that you're going to dig through it i don't think that that should i don't think that the language should stop you right if you're listening to this podcast right now because you've never played an rpg and you want to hear about rpgs i think you should still pick up troll babes so i'm i'm literally going back on it in the middle of my rambling we never said you shouldn't i think you just i think a new gm should be prepared for what this text is going to look like i will say that at the table it's pretty easy to run that was going to be my follow up. If the if the language was cl- not cleaned up but simplified, if the if the rule book was simplified to a seventh grade reading level, would you recommend this for a new GM? Yes, one hundred percent. If you go into this knowing that it was that it was written in the twenty aughts, and it's there wasn't a lot of options in the twenty aughts. That's why the forge is like a big deal. So when he's writing about these concepts that we understand now. They were not understood then. It's a huge deal. Yes, but there was still, I mean, there was, like I said, there was seven years of the Forge working and and game designers coming working together to like try to come up with this accessible language that we all enjoy and take for granted now. I was able to make it through just fine by skipping the diagrams and like just reading the rules that were rules and not the guides to game Ming as conversation or conversation gamified conversation I guess you could call it I think if you I think if you pick up this book knowing that there's going to be dense segments but that the rules inside are good anyone could GM this game I think that's a good endorsement I hope so I feel like I'm being overly harsh I I, I am very fascinated and I would love to hear other people's thoughts on the language used in Troll Babe please have mercy on me <laughs> But I would love to hear your thoughts. All 
Our next segment is Return with the Elixir. This is the segment where we give you other media that could inspire your stories or explore these same ideas. So Zach, what is some media that you make a connection to in regards to Troll Babe? My first is any story that features a hero on a quest uh, who is alone and trying to achieve some grand goal, right? Give uh, me an example. I, I, I will. Okay, fine. My first thought was Samurai Jack. Samurai Jack is the classic and fantastic Cartoon Network series about a lone samurai who is flung into the distant future by Aku, the shape-shifting master of darkness. And Samurai Jack basically travels the world alone, trying to find a way back home. And as he does so, he makes connections with people in that world and uh, forges relationships and uh, he helps them and they help him. And soon his his influence and his ability to enact change and help people grows into a worldwide scale, um, which I think perfectly reflects Troll Babe. Uh, I think possibly to a lesser extent, I would lump um, basically any Incredible Hulk television or movie in here as well. Incredible Hulk has all this power traveling from town to town. You think of like the end credits of the Incredible Hulk television series where he's just like walking down the road all alone to his next place where he's going to have to find somebody to help. Uh, As well as to a lesser extent, Xena Warrior Princess, which I never saw, but I feel like probably has very similar vibes. My heart is broken. I lived by Xena. It was Xena and then Hercules and then the crossover episodes. Well, that actually leads me into mine. I listed Hercules, and I was thinking of the Disney movie, not the TV show, because I don't quite remember the beginning of the Kevin Sorbo TV show, but in the movie Hercules, the Disney movie Hercules, he starts off kind of wrecking havoc in his own little village, and first it starts off in his own little house, and then it starts in his little village, and then it explores to the whole world. But I think that Hercules is a story about a dude going on adventures. I mean, he's fulfilling quests that were given to him from somebody else, but he starts off small and then ends a god in Olympus or a demigod in Olympus, at Olympus. So I think that kind of follows along the same sort of path there. And I'm going to bring something else up and you can laugh at me if you want, want, but I think love actually hits (laughs) on some of these themes. It, It hits on those relationships and kind of the ripple effect that those relationships can mm. have on your own personal life, right? Like, I hate to admit it, but I totally see it. It's so good. Yeah. It's so good, that interconnections of those relationships. And then, you know, I, well, I don't want to spoil it, Love. Actually, I know it's old and everybody's watched it, but I don't really want to spoil anything. But, like, when one character does something really terrible, it affects everybody else. Everybody at the airport is all like, what? <laughs> I, can, I just, uh, I love that movie so much. And then there is one more thing that I kept flip-flopping about, and I wasn't sure if I was going to include it, but the more that you were talking about the scale, the more that I felt like it was necessary. Seven Deadly Sins, the anime on (laughs) Netflix, I'm bringing it up. There is a giantess in the show, which is why I initially thought about it, but the Seven Deadly Sins are seven people in this world who are super effing famous they're each individually famous for their own thing and because they're all they're all individually famous they come together and become famous as their own group so it is that that's that seven it's that level seven that scale seven like they can affect the whole continent and they chose to work together as opposed to working against each other because they could have and they do sometimes Mm, that's fair oh dang it i had another one too no you always have too many i know my last is I should probably start talking about the music, right? Because I make soundtracks for all of our games mm-hmm. and I should probably actually start like putting those up. But the playlist that I made for our Troll Babes game, I was trying to collect as much instrumental progressive rock as I possibly could. I was looking for Nordic rock. I was looking for prog rock, um, just trying to get as much stuff that kind of got the vibe of the that badass horned viking woman on airbrushed on the side of a van as i could possibly find what i ended up with was i think a pretty good playlist i think most notably there was a weird mishmash uh including the swords age of winters which is surprisingly fantastic i only discovered it because of looking for songs for this 
uh, Austin Wintry's Banner Saga soundtrack, which the Banner Saga is a actually probably a good recommendation in its own right, a turn-based tactical RPG featuring huge horned Viking humanoids. I also use the Vikings OST. This is, or I also use this original soundtrack to the television show Vikings. And that worked really well, too. Such a good show. Also, actually, a good recommendation. I I stopped when um, a major character dies because I no longer cared. He was the only reason I was watching. But he starts off as a small farmer who doesn't do anything and ends up... Spoilers. The the king. (laughs) I don't know that it's spoilers. I mean, it's... It's also... It's based on historical or legendary figures, right? He's legendary. The others are historical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ragnar. I'm just going to spoil it. Ragnar. Love him. I loved it. Last recommendation I just remembered are since Troll Babes, there has been uh, quite a few games that do similar one stat, one number, you roll under for one result and roll higher for another result. One of the most popular is a game called Lasers and Feelings, uh, which is a Star Trek-esque game. Uh, I think it's you roll under for lasers, you roll over for feelings, and uh, that's your only stats. And Lasers and Feelings has its own, like, hundred of hacks. Um, Troll Babes is also very hackable, which I think leads into our next segment, which is a story I would like to tell with this game. Diana, what's a story you'd like to tell with this game? I want to play, I want to tell a story of a troop of troll babes who work for a corporation or an agency. Now, why do you want to make them corporate? Because that feels so bad I was, to I me. So I was originally thinking of like a inspectors kind of crossover situation, mm. but then I nixed that. I think that might be too complicated. I just feel like it would be fun to add a touch of bureaucracy just a little i think it'd be fun like just like an overlord like charlie's angels like there's somebody who tells them what to do but they're still badass women charlie's angels that's what i want to play i want to play charlie's angels with troll babes that's exactly what i want to play okay. they're each indi- individually badass women but they follow what the voice on the intercom says i feel like that'd be cool who's also a troll babe who's also a troll babe okay maybe i or a baby troll <sighs> What? <laughs> that would just be funny. Just play on words. It's a baby troll. I don't, I don't think that's a play on words. I think that's just the... A... <laughs> Whatever. I think it would be great. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That's what I would want to do. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. <laughs> just like three or four badass babes going around, locking horns, and then answering a call. I think it's better if it's like someone really small and somebody they should not be intimidated by or respect, but it is. <laughs> like a Like a small human person i'm sticking with it i think it'd be a great story all right uh is there anything else that you want to talk about for troll babes did we miss anything that is burning in your heart to talk about no i just want to reiterate this is a very fun game to play and i think you should play it go into the text knowing you're going to come out with a phd but it's going to be a great time it is still available i believe through adept press's website I would recommend picking it up, if not just to actually play, but also for the history that it represents to me and the amount of influence that it has had on other modern designers. Every designer that I follow or whose work I respect has cited Troll Babe as a major influence. And that was one of the biggest reasons why I picked it up was because I wanted it as an artifact of gaming. Um, And I got a really great game out of it. The Farrier's Bellows is a production of The Gauntlet. You can find us on Twitter at GauntletRPG. You can find us on our website at gauntlet-rpg.com, and we are on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet, where you can contribute to The Gauntlet and support more great shows like ours. Also, check out the forums at forums.gauntlet-rpg.com and let us know what you think of the episode. We want to send a special thank you to our editor, Zach B. We also want you to find us on iTunes or Spotify or wherever it is that you listen to your podcasts. Please rate and subscribe to us. We would really, really appreciate it. You can follow Diana and I on Twitter at Farriers Bellows. Talk to us and talk about us. We would love to hear your thoughts on the show and on the game. Please share us with people you know. We really, really appreciate it. You can find me personally on Twitter at ZWGarth. And me at ICDiana. Until next time, you cannot dream yourself into a character. You must hammer and forge yourself one. Remember, you can always call in a sudden ally. Ally.